Moving away from our neurotoxic clostridia into our histotoxic clostridia, Clostridium shovii is the cause of black leg. Um, we see this in cattle, but also our small ruminants. Clostridium shovii is really common in the environment and feces. Because this organism is so ubiquitous, endospores are commonly ingested, and typically they pass through the body without incident. Occasionally, if they make their way out of the gastrointestinal tract, perhaps into the bloodstream, they can get lodged in uh, distant tissues. And oftentimes this occurs in the hindquarters and the cardiac muscle. And then we see disease when the spores are stimulated to germinate. We don't really know how this happens. Um, it's hypothesized that the inciting factor for germination is some sort of injury, perhaps vaccination or the animal bumping into something, uh, something that causes damage that results in a little bit of ischemia and a locally anaerobic environment that's more hospitable to the growth of Clostridium shovii. This disease is an acute febrile illness. We would see lameness, oftentimes just sudden death. Uh, we see necrotizing myositis and a systemic tox toxemia. And in cases where we have pathology in the hind limb, um, you oftentimes find these animals with the affected leg up. So they'll be lying on their side with the leg that has the Clostridium shovii infection up. Clostridial organisms oftentimes are gas producers, and so in affected tissues, you may feel crepitation. So this is sort of the feeling of popping bubble wrap. You can feel gas bubbles moving through the subcutaneous tissues. On necropsy, muscle is dark red to black and has a very spongy appearance, as you can see in this image on the right, and apparently is associated with a rancid butter odor. Treatment of these infections is generally not practical or possible. Oftentimes it is so rapidly progressive that you're only going to find a dead animal. But if you did have one that you were suspecting of uh, being early in the course of disease, high doses of penicillin plus surgical debridement of affected tissues would be the way to go. On the left image here, uh, what you can see is the other common site of infection, the cardiac muscle. And you may be able to appreciate these foci of darkened necrotic tissues here. Um, again, the heart is obviously a, an indispensable organ, and when we have this type of pathology, it's rapidly fatal. Protection against Clostridium shovii uh, can be gained through vaccination and multivalent clostridial vaccines. Clostridium septicum is a cause of malignant edema. This is a disease that we see in primarily large animals, agricultural animals of all ages. Uh, the organisms are typically found in the soil, and we see infection following deep puncture plus trauma. So vaccination, possibly surgery through the umbilicus and neonates. And you can see outbreaks in a herd following group procedures with perhaps unsanitary equipment. So shearing, tail docking, et cetera. This is an acute fatal toxemia. We get the production of these very grimly named necrotoxins, which cause extensive edema and gangrene. And what you're going to see grossly is a lesion at the site of infection and then edema at other body sites. This is an image of a pig which had malignant edema. It was described as having locally extensive uh, cervical necrotizing rhabdomyositis, so necrotizing lesions of the muscles. And you can see just how puffy and swollen this animal was, uh, the leakage of fluids um, into the uh, interstitium. Treatment of malignant edema, oftentimes, again, not practical. You're probably just going to find dead animals, but high-dose penicillin given systemically and injected around the primary lesion would be uh, the treatment of choice, as well as antitoxin, which is very, very expensive. This disease is controlled using good hygiene when performing invasive procedures and also vaccination. In people, Clostridium septicum is a rare pathogen, uh, but is associated with fatal infections uh, in patients who have colon carcinomas. Clostridium novii type B, we think of as primarily a disease of sheep, but it also occurs in cattle and rarely pigs and horses. Like the other organisms, it is acquired from the environment. Um, and it's thought that the environment becomes contaminated from uh, carrier animals, which defecate on the pasture. This disease is an acute necrotic hepatitis, and affected animals are typically just found dead. It most commonly occurs in well-nourished adult sheep, so animals that otherwise look quite good. 
And the way that we think this disease happens is we have spores which reach the liver hematogenously. And like our Clostridium chauvii, they germinate when there's some sort of necrotic or ischemic insult. Upon germination, they release alpha toxin, which causes the pathology. Interestingly, this disease is oftentimes associated with liver flukes, so fasciola hepatica, um, or other trauma to the liver. There's really no effective treatment available, and so control relies upon vaccination and controlling other inciting causes. In these images here, you can see uh, focal areas of hepatic necrosis. I think it's quite evident on this image on the left. And then on the right here, we have the cut surface of the liver, of a bovine liver, where you can see this uh, large area that almost has a cooked appearance. Clostridium perfringens is a bacteria which produces many different types of toxins, which cause a variety of diseases. So to briefly go through them, our alpha toxin is alecithinase. It attacks cell membranes and results in necrosis. Beta toxin is a pore forming toxin. Um, it binds to endothelial cells and causes necrosis. Both epsilon and iota toxin are protoxins, so they're actually released by the organism in an inactive form, and they're activated by proteolytic enzymes within the animal. CPE, or Clostridium perfringens enterotoxin, is another pore forming toxin, which also disrupts uh, tight junctions. It's released during sporulation, and it's responsible for food poisoning in people. And then we have the NET family of toxins, NET-F and NET-B, of the necrotic enteritis toxins, uh, which are both pore forming toxins. Clostridium perfringens can be grouped into toxinotypes based on which toxins each strain is producing. So type A clostridium perfringens produces alpha toxin plus or minus the net B and F. It causes gangrenous infections, hemorrhagic and necrotizing gastroenteritis. Type B is responsible for lamb dysentery. Type C causes neonatal hemorrhagic and necrotizing enteritis in a variety of species. Type D is associated with overeating disease in sheep. Type E, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis in cattle. Type F is what causes foodborne illness in people. And finally, type G causes avian necrotic enteritis. And we're going to go through these in just a little bit more detail in the following slides. So we're going to start with type A. This is the most widespread toxinotype and it's found in the guts of both healthy and diseased animals. And as a result of this, its exact role in enteric disease is somewhat challenging to demonstrate. Um, if you remember back to our lecture on pathogenesis and Cox postulates, uh, we haven't really fulfilled them for type A clostridium and enteric disease. If we were to culture uh, type A clostridium perfringens from an animal with diarrhea, did we simply find a colonized animal? or is it actually associated with pathology? It's a challenge. Its association with non-enteric syndromes is clearer. So both gas gangrene and emphysematous uh, abomasitis in ruminants. Type B causes lamb dysentery. Uh, this is a high morbidity and high mortality disease in uh, our sheep that oftentimes results in sudden death. It's predisposed by an abrupt change in diet. And we see it in the very young animals. The reason for this is that colostrum, so that first milk from the dam, contains antitrypsin substances, which prevent degradation of the toxin by the normal proteolytic enzymes in the animal's gut. So those uh, toxins, which would normally be degraded, are able to build up and able to ultimately cause this hemorrhagic enteritis that you can see here. Similarly, type C, uh, Clostridium perfringens causes hemorrhagic uh, enteritis in piglets. We can see outbreaks of entire litters, and what we see is a rapidly progressive high mortality uh, enteric disease, oftentimes resulting in death within 24 hours. These same organisms can cause infections in calves, foals, and lambs, and again, just like our sheep, uh, the trypsin susceptibility of the toxin really explains the predilection for this uh, disease in neonates. Necrotic enteritis in chickens is an acute enterotoxemia. Uh, in affected birds, um, again, we may just see sudden death due to necrosis of the small intestine, but if you do catch them early enough, 
they're going to be anorexic, they're going to be depressed, dehydrated, and they're going to look unkempt. They'll have really ruffled feathers. In this image on the left, you can see this severe acute uh, necrohemorrhagic enteritis, these very reddened, inflamed intestines. I think you can appreciate there's bloody material in here, possibly even fibrin casts uh, of the intestine. And then on the right, we have the inside of the intestine, which is reddened, inflamed, and very, very angry looking. Clostridium perfringens type D causes a systemic disease in sheep. Um, this one is often referred to as overeating disease, and it's associated with animals that suddenly get access to a really lush pasture or grain. What we think happens is that the excess starch content stimulates the overgrowth of Clostridium perfringens, and we get excess production of epsilon toxin, leading to the systemic toxemia. Again, it's an acute disease. So you oftentimes just find animals dead. And the name, pulpy kidney disease, comes from the pathological lesion seen on necropsy. So we get autolysis of the kidney. It just becomes sort of soft and pulpy. Because the pathogenesis of this disease has a dietary component, managing the diet is an important uh, strategy for prevention. Here you can see just how pulpy those kidneys look. So we have uh, tubular nephrosis uh, caused by that epsilon toxin, resulting in this really softened, uh, sort of liquidy, mushy appearance of the renal cortex. On the right, we have a cut section of a sheep's brain. And what I think you can appreciate down here is bilateral, symmetrical, uh, thalamic hemorrhage and necrosis, which is caused by that epsilon toxin reaching the brain. And the brain and the kidneys are in fact the two sites of the body where you're most likely to see uh, pathological changes in overeating disease. Type A clostridium, those which produce net F, have also been associated with some hemorrhagic enteritis syndromes in dogs and horses. So in dogs, acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome, formerly known as hemorrhagic gastroenteritis or HGE, has been associated with net F clostridium perfringens. Um, this disease is really not very well characterized. Um, it does have a rapid onset. You may see necrotic lesions and frank blood in the feces. And the mortality rate is really undetermined. It hasn't been well enough studied. In horses, the similar strains are associated with enterocolitis in young foals, so those less than three weeks of age. Clostridium perfringens type F in people is associated with food and waterborne illness, and it's actually the second most common cause of bacterial foodborne infections. It can cause necrotizing um, intestinal disease called fire bowels, which sounds absolutely horrendous. And it's associated with eating foods that have trypsin inhibitors, so inhibiting those enzymes, those proteolytic enzymes that can break down bacterial toxins. Trypsin inhibitor containing foods include things like peanuts, sweet potato, and cassava. A few years ago on a trip to Turkey, um, I noticed that on the nutritional information of uh, some bottled water, uh, Clostridium perfringens was assayed for. Clostridium piliforme is the cause of Tizer's disease in horses. Uh, this is most commonly seen in apparently thriving foals. Um, Tizer's disease also occurs in rabbits. And like many of the conditions we've talked about, animals are oftentimes simply found dead or comatose. Classically, this disease um, is described as a multifocal hepatic necrosis, and you may also find lesions in the heart or intestines. In this image on the right, uh, you can see what multifocal hepatic necrosis looks like post-mortem. All of these little white spots um, that are occurring are areas of, of necrosis and dead tissue. We also have necrohemorrhagic tiflitis, so inflammation of the cecum, um, and this would be an example of Tizer's disease in a rabbit. Clostridioides difficile is a very important pathogen in people, and in veterinary medicine, it's probably most important in pigs. Um, it causes early onset scours in young piglets, uh, resulting in sudden death, um, and mesocolonic edema is the classical pathological finding. Um, it's actually an important differential diagnosis for edema disease, which we'll talk about in our lecture on E. coli. 
pathology associated with Clostridioides difficile infections um, is a result of two toxins, toxin A, which is an enterotoxin that causes fluid accumulation, and toxin B, which is a potent cytotoxin. What we see is colonic dysregulation and cellular death, and it's important to know that not all strains are toxigenic, so it's possible to have non-toxigenic Clostridioides difficile in the gut, not causing any problems at all. Here you can see some images of mesocolonic edema in a pig, and what I want you to appreciate is this really glistening appearance of the serosal surface of the spiral colon. This sort of uh, wet, moist appearance is classical of edema and would be a hallmark finding um, in animals infected with Clostridioides difficile. In our companion animal species, there's very little evidence that Clostridioides difficile is actually associated with disease. It's been found in both healthy and diarrheic animals. So if you were to culture it from a dog or a cat, that culture would be really difficult to interpret. Is it causing the disease or were they just a, a carrier? Because this is an important human pathogen, the question of companion animals serving as a reservoir for people is of course an important one to ask, but it's always gonna be difficult to demonstrate who gave it to whom exactly. Did the dog pick up the Clostridioides difficile from drinking out of the toilet, or has the person gotten Clostridioides difficile from picking up the dog poop in the backyard? In people, it does cause a debilitating disease. Um, classically, it's been antibiotic-associated diarrhea, particularly following exposure to macrolide-type drugs like clindamycin, although community-associated infections are increasingly recognized. Treatment can be really challenging and unrewarding. This is an infection where physicians have used antimicrobials such as vancomycin and metronidazole, and we're increasingly seeing uh, novel approaches to this infectious disease, including things like fecal transplants, so essentially trying to reset the normal, healthy uh, enteric microbiota by taking feces from a healthy individual and transplanting that into an unhealthy, affected individual. So how exactly do you give a fecal transplant from a healthy individual into one who's affected? Well, there's two ways that that feces can reach the colon. It can either be inserted up as a suppository, essentially a fecal enema, or it can be consumed in the form of feces-containing capsules. Because Clostridioides difficile is such an important and debilitating disease, um, it's one which is tracked by our National Resistance Surveillance Program. Here on this graph, what you can see is the rate of Clostridioides difficile infections from 2016 through 2020 in both uh, hospitalized and non-hospitalized patients. When you think you're dealing with one of these Clostridium or Clostridioides infections, what do you collect? Well, in the case of tetanus, Smears or swabs from lesions would be really useful in identifying those drumstick-shaped organisms. Classically, the way that this is diagnosed is serum from an affected animal was injected into a mouse to identify circulating neurotoxin. Fortunately, this isn't really done anymore. Clostridium botulinum, uh, similar toxicity studies used to be done in the past. Clostridium shovii, septicum, and novii, so these histotoxic ones. Culture is certainly possible. Um, remember, you're probably going to find these animals dead. And so what you want to do is collect a large chunk of affected tissue. We want to maintain that anaerobic environment at the center so that we can hopefully recover live organisms in the lab. You can collect fixed tissues for histology. And we have fluorescent antibody tests to identify the organisms in situ. For Clostridium perfringens, uh, fecal cultures in cases of diarrhea, really important, renal tissues for pulpy kidney disease. We're going to be doing things like gram stains to look for that box car, uh, morphology of the cells, identification of toxins by PCR, and histopathology is also very useful. For Clostridioides difficile, culture of the feces is certainly possible, as is identifying toxin genes by PCR from either a pure culture or from the feces itself. There's many different diagnostic options available, whether it is uh, based on pathology, cytology, histology, fluorescent antibody tests. Um, really important to talk to the lab about uh, which tests are most appropriate in each case, and also how to interpret the findings.
So in a dog with diarrhea, we generally don't recommend doing fecal cultures because if you culture Clostridium perfringens, does it indicate infection or just colonization? And then finally, it's important to recognize that not all species are culturable. So Clostridium piliforme will not actually grow independently on agar plates. It requires specialized propagative methods, including cell cultures. As far as zoonotic and interspecies transmission goes, uh, Clostridium perfringens is an important and common cause of foodborne illness, sort of right behind Salmonella and Staph aureus, and it's primarily associated with contaminated meat products. Clostridioides difficile may be zoonotically acquired from pigs, but this relationship is really ill-defined, and I think we need more research to know exactly which direction it's transmitting or how commonly this may occur. The direct transmission of other clostridial species is really quite uncommon, and these would generally not be considered important zoonotic agents. I have a few important uh, new terms for today, and then of course some questions for self-assessment. Thank you.